It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Tim Blake Nelson is an actor, a character actor, basically. He's from Tulsa, and you can hear a little bit of his accent. He plays that accent up in some of his roles. Maybe he'll play a desert-dwelling outsider, a corporate type from Texas who wears boots, maybe a Faulkner character. It's also made him an unforgettable part of some great movies, like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The Coen Brothers classic. Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Delver, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that Piggly Wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. Now he's starring in another Coen Brothers movie. It's called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It just came out on Netflix. It's a Western made up of six vignettes. Each story is about the Old West, told in archetypes. A bounty hunter, a wagoneer, the big goofy gold miner with a big goofy beard and a burro. The kind of stuff that makes up the Coen's bread and butter. But like most great Coen films, it's more about how those archetypes get used. In Buster Scruggs, they're tweaked, caricatured, sometimes subverted, and it's all done in the service of bigger themes, stuff like love, capitalism, justice, and death. My guest Tim Blake Nelson plays the title character in the movie, Buster Scruggs, star and subject of the first vignette. He's a handsome, kind of flamboyantly dressed singing cowboy with a revolver in his holster and a guitar around his back, a little bit like Gene Autry. He has a way with words. Like in this scene, from the very beginning of the movie, Buster, who's played by Tim, is on horseback. He's ambling along a canyon in the kind of desert that you might see in a Wile E. Coyote cartoon. And as we're about to hear, he turns to the camera to introduce himself. And by the way, uh, one visual thing, about halfway through this, he pulls out a wanted poster with his picture on it that labels him the misanthrope. Let's listen. The song never fails to ease my mind out here in the West where the distances are great and the scenery monotonous. Additionally, my pleasing baritone seems to inspire old Dan here and keep him in good heart during the day's measure of hoof clops. Ain't that right, Dan? <laughs> Maybe some of y'all have heard of me. Buster Scruggs, known to some as the San Saba Songbird. I got other handles, nicknames, appellations, and cognomens, but this one here, I don't consider to be even halfway earned. Misanthrope? I don't hate my fellow man, even when he's tiresome and surly and tries to cheat at poker. I figure that's just the human material, and him that finds in it cause for anger and dismay is just a fool for expecting better. Ain't that right, Dan? Tim Blake Nelson, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. I have to say that I laughed almost embarrassingly loud in a hushed, sincere, serious critic screening of this film uh, when you banged on the guitar strings as you swung the guitar over to your back. Well, that's 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 Joel and Ethan. Uh, there's a, a technique uh, which they developed with their sound designer, Skip Levski, uh, called the hubcap, mm-hmm. uh, and in a Cohen film, whenever something is disturbed and usually ends up being dispatched to a resting place off screen, you'll get a little bit of an extra sound uh, from it, like and a hubcap that's rolling off a. You're uh, doing the gesture uh, of a yeah, settling hubcap. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, and they call it the hubcap. Uh, Joel and Ethan use sound, I think, better than any other filmmakers around, at least of which I know, other than maybe uh, Steven Spielberg. It's such uh, a presence in their movies. And, uh, and of course, what you're describing there is definitely foleyed. Uh, so they put that in and sweetened it. And, and that's just Joel and Ethan to a T. When you're watching a film, often the sound is entirely transparent to you like you don't the sound is desi- is often designed to be unnoticeable and because all of the aesthetics in a Coen brother Coen brothers movie are 
fifteen percent more saturated. Like everything is is heightened in this odd way. Just that moment of the guitar making a noise, it it, it like it makes you notice the artifice of film because guitars do make a noise when you do that, but they don't make a noise when you do that in a movie. That's precisely right. And Joel and Ethan are always, as you as you imply, making movies about movies. That's always a part of what's going on, and it's part of what delights one when when you see a Coen Brothers movie. You know that's happening, and you just want more and more of it. It's why I like to say that their films are, above everything else, generous. There's this idea of the Old West as this lawless world, but so much of the Western genre is about the order being imposed on it by a good guy. Um, you know, somebody riding a sheriff or whatever it is, right? And in this film, it's a story about the lawlessness and grotesquerie of the Old West as an idea, right? Like that there's no rules and anything can happen and people die and stuff. But it leaves out the part about someone coming in to make the rules <laughs> like it's really just about yes living in a lawless world is brutal and terrifying and also the actual world that we live in all of our ideas of like what the rules are are more tenuous than we give them credit for i think that's certainly true uh and joel and ethan if they're anything are uh, leaving their their personal beliefs aside, they are decidedly Old Testament in that the the universe, whether it's God conducting it or some other force, uh, is an unpredictable, wrathful, and violent place. And the more man tries to control it and make sense of it, the more tragic uh, his demise. In the case of Buster Scruggs, he's got a code which is uh, uh, he'll never start a fight, but he'll always end one lethally. And they've written a character who would be a great friend, but a terrible enemy uh, for you to have. But even he can't control his own destiny because he, when he least expects it, has his own reckoning. Could you already do the things that singing cowboys can do? I mean, you're riding, playing... Uh, singing, shooting. I think those are the top four skills involved in being a singing cowboy, right? It was, uh, it, it, I, so I didn't know how to play the guitar. Uh, I had to learn to do that. And I certainly didn't know how to twirl pistols. I ride well enough, but riding without being able to hold the reins and steer the horse uh, with my hands and therefore needing to do it with my knees that necessitated literally, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, five and a half months of prep because it has to look like he's done it all his life. And I didn't want to be on set worrying about whether my G chord was was right. So I just I had to learn it to the extent to where I could just literally walk around the house playing the guitar while carrying on a conversation with someone um, where I could twirl the pistols while talking with my wife and and spin the um, the gun right into my holster without having to look at it, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the Peter Pan life of an actor. It's, it's, it's constant regeneration. So getting to play a part like this at age 53, it's, that's, that was my, that's been my dream. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it was a great challenge. You're listening to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Tim Blake Nelson, star of the new Coen Brothers movie, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. I, I want to play a scene of you, my guest, Tim Blake Nelson, uh, in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It's about three inmates who escape from jail in search of buried treasure. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen it, seen it come on, get your act together. Uh, about halfway through the movie, uh, Pete, who's played by John Turturro, goes missing. And Delmar, played by my guest, uh, Tim Blake Nelson, decides that that uh, Torturo's character got turned into a toad. And so when Delmar walks into a movie theater and finds Pete back in handcuffs on a chain gang, 
uh, he is quite surprised. Do not seek the treasure. It's a bushwhack. They're fixing an ambush. Do not seek the treasure. We thought you was a toad. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways, it's it, the character is entirely different from uh, your character in Buster Scruggs, but it's the whole thing is so mannered that if there's any winking, the whole house of cards would collapse. And so you just have to have this beautiful, absolute commitment to the reality of that manneredness. Yeah, that's what the Cullen brothers ask for. And and I think that's why you see them casting time and time again actors who've been trained uh, formally in heightened language. So Fran, John Turturro, Michael Stuhlbarg in A Serious Man, I, uh, you know, all so many of us, almost everyone in their sort of stable, their stable yeah. yeah went to school, uh, went to a drama drama school and studied Shakespeare and Shaw and um, restoration comedy, all, all of us. And what that trains you to do is to pick up a script, internalize the terms of its reality, and play them without any... Um, without any uh, sense of irony or seeming uh, over-intentionality or histrionics. You simply accept that that's the truth. It's a heightened world, and you become a part of it uh, and, and engage with it on its terms. You lift yourself up to its terms. And I don't think that I would be able to do what I've tried to do for the for the Coens and the parts that I've had uh, without having had that training. Now, here's the thing that I'm confused about, Tim Blake Nelson. You went to literally two of the best schools in the world for college and graduate school. You studied possibly actually the two least practical things <laughs> you can study. <laughs> You went and got a degree in classics at a at a top tier Ivy League university, and then you went off to arts college <laughs> at Juilliard. <laughs> so, did you just have older siblings who had already broken down your parents, or were they like, well, if you're going to go into the arts or into scholarship, you got to do it ten out of ten, and if you're doing it ten out of ten, it's okay. I think it was probably a bit more of the latter, um, and and uh, you know we weren't um, the Soros family or something, but I definitely had resources to fall back on, and so and my education was paid for by my parents, so I graduated without debt, and that was an incredible help. Uh, I'm not going to lie about that uh, or try to mislead. So that so I didn't have certain pressures on me that others do. I think my father probably wondered a bit about what was going to come of all this, uh, and I don't blame him for that. My mother did a very astonishing thing, however, which was during my freshman year in college, she came up to, to visit me, and we were at dinner, and she, she said, well, what are you going to do this summer? It was the spring, and I said, well, I think I'm going to come home. And, and stay with you. And my parents uh, were divorced at this point, and the, revor the, the divorce was fairly recent, and so she was alone, and, and I think lonely, uh, and so had every reason to, to, to think, well, great, he's going to come home. I'll have one of my children home for the summer in the house. Um, but that's not what she... She didn't respond to that um, temptation. She said, well, 
what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I think I want to become a classicist. Uh, I'd like to teach Latin in high school or maybe even get an, a master's and a PhD and pursue a, a life in the academy as a, as a professor. Uh, and, and she said, look, nothing would make me happier than to have uh, a scholar as a, as a son. So that's fine. Great. But now is the time to take chances. And you did used to like acting in high school. Why don't you, instead of coming home, you're still going to major in classics. That's, you've made that clear. That's there for you in your future. Why don't you spend the summer acting at one of these summer theaters? I said, oh, Mom, it's not that easy. And she basically said, don't give me your excuses. You have no family. You don't have any financial concerns right now. You don't even have a girlfriend with whom you may want to be. You're totally unaffili unaffiliated. Go get a job at a summer theater. And she even helped me do that through a connection. And so I did. I, I went and acted in a summer theater, and I, we did Hay Fever and Real Inspector Hound and uh, Lanford Wilson's play The Fifth of July. And I realized in that one summer that my mother had encouraged me to have, go be an actor, she had essentially said, try that out that it is what I wanted to do. And I returned for my sophomore year in college and, and, and uh, uh, stuck with my classics major because I just loved it, but determined this is what I was going to do. And, I, and um, I, I pursued it vigorously uh, with her complete encouragement. And I think that's a pretty unlikely story, um, but it's true. Your family's Jewish. To what extent... Were there other Jews around in Tulsa when you were a kid? The Tulsa Jewish community is uh, a, a very cohesive one. Um, everybody knew each other and looked out for each other. It was amazing to grow up with European grandparents and a mother who'd been born in London but spent her first five years in Germany and in London. Uh, and And... And to celebrate Passover and, uh, and the high holidays in the middle of Tulsa, Oklahoma, I felt like I had everything because I'm growing up in the heartland and was aware enough to realize that there was strangely something quite special about that. As the world at that point was, the country at, at that point was already becoming more and more homogenous through television and advertisements and and various periodicals making us, you know, th making tastes more and more common, and regionalisms more and more, uh, less and less distinct. And I, I already had an understanding, as I think most of us did in Tulsa in the seventies that we were in a special place that was in its way protected because nobody was coming to Tulsa for any attractions. Oral Roberts University, I mean, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't a tourist destination. It was its own enclave. And yet I also had this foundation that was distinctively European with grandparents who'd brought over somehow, I really don't know how they did it, all their flatware from Europe. And we would have these Passover dinners or breakfasts on these European plates with rumor glasses of, of hand-cut crystal. And I just felt incredibly blessed. And I loved all the funny accents at the synagogue from the European refugees where you could hear people who were like a, off of a You Don't Have to Be Jewish album in the synagogue and then go out and hear people saying, hey, <laughs> what's going on uh, outside? That just wasn't lost on us, my family and, and, and me. There's this David Cross album, David Cross, who is Jewish and grew up in Georgia, where, and I don't remember which album it is, and 
and this is I'm quoting from memory, but he describes the scene where he's over at a friend's house when he's you know 12 years old or whatever, and he has a sleepover, and the next morning. I'm making up the specifics. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, so my apologies to the great David Cross. But his, the mom asks him, do y'all's people eat pancakes? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, like, that is, like, such a particular thing of being Jewish in a place where there's not that many Jews is it's not about hostility, but just a kind of, a vague awareness that things are done differently, but complete ignorance about in what specific different way they're done. Yeah, but also a benign fascination. I mean, I actually felt appreciated. Kids wanted to come to your bar mitzvah. They were astounded to sit there and listen to the Hebrew. Couldn't believe that they were hearing that. It was exciting, fascinating. There's that line, there's a line in uh, Cormac McCarthy's novel, Outer Dark, and somebody asks another character, do you know what a Jew is? And the character responds, well, they're them old-timey people in the Bible. And that's, that's what I felt growing up, that people embraced us, treated us as special friends. It was only when I went to the Northeast, to college, and then particularly in New York, that I really ever encountered anti-Semitism to speak of. So that's not what you'd expect, but it was my truth. Tim, we're running low on time, but um, you know, you would think that I would use this time to play a clip from one of the one of your many brilliant acting performances in acclaimed films, or one of your own brilliant acclaimed films. But instead, I'm going to play a clip from Scooby Doo Two. My guest, Tim Blake Nelson, played the villain of Dr. Jonathan Jacobo in Scooby Doo Two: Colon Monsters Unleashed. Jacobo is a former scientist and master of disguise who committed bank robberies for his experiments to create real monsters. In this scene from the end of the film, he's been apprehended. The gang unveiled his guises as the evil masked figure and Heather Jasper Howe, played by Alicia Silverstone. Let's uh, take a listen. Is it you getting the lead in my fair lady, wasn't it? Huh? I was an excellent Eliza. You were too active. And stealing my tater tots! You kept saying you felt puffy! And the real identity of Ned is... Ow! Ned! I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those meddling punks and their dumb dog! That's an actor's dream to get to say I would have gotten away with it! I got to say the line, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was great. I only ended up playing that part thanks to my um, my oldest son Henry. He was five at the time, and when the offer came in, I responded on the phone incredulously, "Scooby Doo Two? By on my way to saying, "I don't know," uh, but before I could say that, he looked up at me and said. He had this very deep voice at the time. You can be in Scooby-Doo, where are you? <laughs> and I said, okay. And I uh, took him to this, you know, he was on the set and had a great time, and so did I. Tim Blake Nelson, I'm so grateful to you for coming on Boulevard. It was really great to get to talk to you. It has been my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Tim Blake Nelson. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs is available to stream now on Netflix. It is an absolute delight. I don't know what I can tell you to recommend it, uh, but I can tell you that if you've already seen it, you will appreciate that I'm about to say, pan shot. It's like a inside reference for future you. Anyway, Tim is also a playwright. His latest work is called Socrates. It's gonna be playing at Martinson Hall in New York starting this April. <laughs> 